This poem is called Three Wise Men. I would like to write a poem that offers, I would like to write a poem with mighty themes that offers shattering insights into life, love, God, and the universe. But I slouch too much. Look how slumped I am. My shoulders are rolled forward, and I'm as hunched as an ape. One day you'll get stuck like that, my mother would say. And I eat too many carbs. <laughs> Have you ever tasted a scotch mallow egg? They are the perfect candy and come in packages of six. I'd eat a whole box right now. The point is, I'm not a fit vessel for wisdom, like, say, David White, John O'Donohue, Walt Whitman, how do those guys get so sure of themselves? I'm not sure of anything. Sometimes I'm so muddled I can't do the New York Times mini crossword, not the real one, the mini. <laughs> My friends do it in under a minute. They send me texts that say, I solved the New York Times mini crossword in 58 seconds. <laughs> hey, that's great, I text back. <laughs> My phone rings. It's Aunt Bernice. She's 95, blind, more than half deaf, occasionally incontinent, unevenly demented, and reliant on me. Not that she lives with me. She's in a facility, a nice one, has her own apartment and everything. I moved her in after she fell and fractured her sacrum. Then she fell again and fractured her pelvis. Now she can't walk. She wants me to have lunch with her today. I'm so lonely it hurts, she says. I imagine she points to her chest, the place just under her sternum where she keeps her loneliness. Come, have a Reuben sandwich. They make great Reubens here. I can't. I'm busy, I say. I'm not lying. I'm writing this poem. I'll visit later in the afternoon, I say. I'll bring cookies. I'm not lying about this either. The cookies will be snickerdoodles. I hang up and Google Spanish guys naked. Do you think David White would Google Spanish guys naked? Yes. John O'Donohue? <laughs> John O'Donohue? Walt Whitman totally would. <laughs> but then he'd write, in the faces of God, I see men. No. <laughs> in the faces of men, I see God. I'm not looking at their faces. I'm not a fit vessel. I imagine myself pointing to my chest, the place just under my sternum, where I'd keep my wisdom if I had any, but it's crowded out by this tussle of needs, mine and my aunt's. Crowded out by the fact that I just decided it's more important for me to write this poem than for my aunt to have some companionship while she eats lunch. Now that she's blind and dotty, sharing a meal with her has become intensely intimate. Explain, helping her arthritic fingers find the last bit of burger, explaining for the fifth time that the wet pieces um, at the bottom of her plate are chunks of cantaloupe, bending the straw to her lips. It shames me to admit that these tasks repulse me. Worse, they enrage me. They make me want to throttle her. Right now, I'd rather stick a thumbtack in my eyeball than help Aunt B eat her lunch. I Google Irish guys naked. <laughs> I imagine myself pointing to my chest, the place just under my sternum, where I'd keep my wisdom if I had any, or my compassion if I had any of that, or mighty, any mighty themes I could muster, shattering insights, a sense of the rightness of things, that this braided suffering my aunt's and mine is somehow beautiful, and the world is better for it. David White, John O'Donohue, Walt Whitman, they'd find something pretty and necessary in all this. They'd write about it so gorgeously it would sound like a prayer, and they'd make it look a certain way too, placing each line, each word, just so. My poem is uneven chunks of text that look like directions for putting together a barbecue. 
I don't have the confidence for mighty themes and staggering insights. I don't have the audacity. Those things give you a certain vantage point, and I'm not there. All I can do is tell you what it's like. This is what today is like. This poem is called The Hour. I set a timer on my phone for an hour, take a breath, walk in. You are where they always put you, in the recliner in your living room. There, you listen to TV, feel sunshine through the window, answer the phone if you hear it ring. You don't wear your hearing aids anymore, so the chances of this are 50-50. Your caregiver, it's Marina today, brushed your white hair flat against your scalp. It's neat, but doesn't hide the fact that you are almost bald. If you could see yourself, you'd be mortified. Your apartment is no longer tidy. Sweater, sweaters wrestle on the couch. Half-empty containers of cookies lay scattershot on the coffee table. Two tissues bunched at your feet, another in your lap. Honestly, you'd be mortified. What day is today, you ask? Monday, I answer. I didn't think you'd stop by today. I stop by every day, except Tuesdays and Thursdays. Well, how am I supposed to keep track? You're always gallivanting around. You smile. I smile too, but you don't see it. This is our greeting now. Only the day changes. I pull up a chair, take your hand. Your fingers are glass filaments in my palm that I am terrified of breaking. Rigid blue veins twine up your arm. I did not realize a person could be so frail and still be alive. How are you this afternoon, I ask. Just ducky, you answer. <laughs> this is how you respond when you are in a good mood. Well, a relatively good mood. The girl today must be new. Can you believe I'm still in my pajamas all day in my pajamas? You're not in your pajamas. I place your hand on your own knee. Feel that? You're wearing your tweed pants. I've never owned anything tweed in my life. <laughs> well, tweedish then. Anyway, they're pants, not pajamas. You run your thumb back and forth, scowl into your lap. Do you trust what your hand is telling you? Do you trust anything? What day is today, you ask? Monday. I answer. I look at my phone. Five minutes have passed. You touch your nostrils in a deeply private way that makes me cringe. You do it again and again. If you could see yourself, you'd be mortified. But your eyes have failed, and your withered brain can't hold an image. Maybe you're no longer capable of being mortified. Maybe this is a good thing. I offer a sip of water anything to get your hand away from your nose. <laughs> what day is today, you ask? Monday, I answer. Another glance, six minutes, no, six minutes, 12 seconds. The hours I spend with you are a burden I don't carry with grace. But your caregivers tell me you are in a better mood after I visit, not so disoriented, fewer delusions, you eat better. I've never been so necessary in my life. This poem is called Flowers for Mary and Me. Hail Mary, full of grace, could you lend me some? My grace cupboards, bare. Actually, all my cupboards, empty. Woe is me, right? Trust me, Mary, I know how good I've got it, how fucking lucky I am. I'm aware of the long list of things I don't have to worry about. But sometimes, like this morning, my urgency deserts me, and I'm left with the weary pull of another day. So, I turn to you. Help me notice the cactuses I bought for $3 a piece at the hardware store a thousand years ago that have each grown to the size of a microwave oven. Their blooms are 
blazing white trumpets with a scent so fragile and delicate, it's almost like being haunted by the ghost of a smell. Help me kindle some wonder so I can lift above my petty mood, my gripes, my wish that things were different. And by different, I mean easier. Here I go again, whining about this task I face, accompanying Aunt Bernice through the last months of her life. You wouldn't know much about that sort of thing, would you, Mary? I'm joking. Gallows humor. Hail Mary, full to the brim with grace. The Lord is with thee, and you can keep him. <laughs> Jesus is too moody. And I don't know what to make of his pious hocus pocus, but you, I understand. Like you, I've sat inside another person's delusions, paranoia, and panic. Like you, I've offered the only things I could, love, loyalty, and a steady presence. Like you, I've waited, sometimes patiently, sometimes not, while they picked their scattered way toward an end anyone could see coming. Blessed art thou, Mary, and blessed is the fruit, the femboy, the sissy, the queer, the homo, the fairy, the faggot, the one who stepped up, me. I'm talking about me. I have a hunch that I am blessed by this strange and difficult love my aunt and I share. I suspect that I am lucky to witness this slow blossoming of death, vision, hearing, mobility, coherence, dignity, all falling open and away, leaving some stripped down essence that's so fragile, so delicate, not yet dead, and she's already a ghost of herself, not yet dead, and she already haunts me. Are you haunted? By anyone, Mary? I wish you and I could have tea together. We could marvel at the plants I see from my window, of course, the $3 cactuses that I got at the hardware store, but also the shrub that's covered in tiny pink pinprick blooms that sometimes smell like soiled laundry and sometimes smell like decay. We could open the window, let the scent roll in. What is it today? Dirty laundry or death? We could try to find grace, humor, humility, and gratitude for our strange and difficult loves. We could offer each other love, loyalty, and a steady presence. We could pray for each other now and at the hour of our strange love's deaths. Amen.